Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The text for this morning's message is the Gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 5. In our text for today, Jesus teaches on four points of the law, and these four points of law are included in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is talking about and speaks of much more than just these four points of law, but our lectionary text for today is limited to these four pieces of law. Jesus here takes the time to explain that sinful human understanding of the law is not sufficient, that we don't even perceive of the extent of God's expectations according to the law. And he is saying, essentially, that if you think that you can keep the law, you had better have another thing. In particular, Jesus is addressing the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees of his day, but also of the general population. The Pharisees <coughs> held themselves in high opinion, but so did the people, as we talked about last week. And he is here. Jesus is here for the common people to speak of faith. Not faith and trust in the Pharisees, <coughs> but faith in him. Faith in Jesus. Because that is the faith that saves. That is the faith by which all righteousness is fulfilled through Jesus. We must be careful even in this today. Sometimes we find ourselves believing in ourselves. Or we find ourselves believing in someone other than Jesus to save us. It won't work. No one else is good enough. There is no one who is good enough to save us except Jesus Christ. And by faith in Him, you are saved from your sin. Christ's four areas of teaching in our text for today deal with anger and lust, divorce, and keeping your word. And in no instance do we on our own in any way fulfill all of God's expectations. We sin, and not only do we sin, but we also cause other people to sin. I am often asked as a pastor, is it possible to be angry without sinning? And the short answer is that among sinful humanity, this is a big no. Sin is a part of all of our human interaction. If we, have, if we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That being said, parents are people who often will get angry. And they need to because they have to train their children. But you have to take a step back and you have to think about your anger and how that anger is going to impact your child and, and not to be abusive to your children. There are authorities in our lives, governmental authorities, who are in charge, who have and do wield the sword. They wield the sword to punish the evil and to reward the good. They, uh, the government can and does use anger. But that too, I think we can all agree, falls short. Our Lord God is the only one who exercises anger perfectly. Our Lord God is the only one who has the perspective on all of our life to know where vengeance is rightly taken. Our Lord God is the only one who has ever done anger perfectly. Our passage for today deals with a relationship that is of family, being angry, with your brother or your sister. This assumes an equal status, and, and I think it also can be something where we have a relationship with each other that is often called brothers and sisters. How often have we been angry with our brother and sister? How often have we insulted or called someone close to us, someone in our family, a fool? How often have we refrained from asking for forgiveness in order to save face? How often have we withheld forgiveness simply because of our hard hearts? Jesus says that these actions are murder. He doesn't say they are like murder. He says they are murder. And, and in God's realm, murder requires a penalty. 
And the penalty is death, and we have all fallen short of God's glory. Because of our sin, we deserve to be put into prison until we have paid the debt. But the problem is, we can't pay the debt. It's too much. What are we to do? How can our righteousness be good enough before God? Jesus then ends his discussion of anger, but he moves on to another topic of sin. Jesus addresses the issue of adultery. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees would have said that they don't commit adultery at all. They've never, never had a sexual relationship outside <coughs> of their marriage. They are perfect with regard to the Sixth Commandment. How many of us would say the same? How many of us would say, I have never done wrong against my spouse? But Jesus ups the ante. He redefines adultery to the nth degree. He says that if you look at a woman <coughs> with lustful intent, you have already committed adultery with her. Even if it is and stays in your mind and your thoughts, you have already sinned. If your heart strives after a woman in a sexual way, you have sinned. Pornography is a part of this. If you participate in pornography, you have stepped out on your spouse, no matter who you are, or even your future spouse. But that's an easy thing to see. It's evil. Pornography turns sex into meaninglessness. It takes away from sexuality the depth of meaning for which it was intended within the context of marriage between a man and a woman. What does Jesus say that we should do because of our sin? He says this, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Right away we find that the penalty for adultery is that your body is thrown into hell. If you want to avoid hell, then before you sin, you should cut off the body parts that cause you to sin. There are two problems with this. The body parts that cause us to sin, if we were to remove them all, would be our whole body. If we were to eliminate those body parts, we would eliminate all that we are. The horse is already out of the barn. Let's be honest. The standard that God sets for this command is very high. And no one has fulfilled and done it exactly the way God expects. What are we going to do? What is the way out? Hell fire is coming. And there is nothing that we can do. But before we can even take a step back and think even further on this, Jesus goes on. He comes at us again, and this time it's about divorce. He starts out talking about the practice of giving a certificate of divorce. In Jesus' day and even before, uh, people could get what we would call no-fault divorce, but there had to be a certificate. And this was de designed in particular to protect the woman, because a woman did not have her own means of financial gain to support her own life, she needed that certificate of divorce to prove that she was not married so that she could get remarried. But Jesus makes it clear, there is only one legitimate reason for divorce, and it is on the grounds of sexual immorality. An illegal piece of paper produced by humanity does not trump what God says about marriage. If God says that it's not divorce, then it's not a divorce. No fault divorce is contrary to the will of God. If we think that divorce is legitimate because the government gives us a piece of paper, we have another thought coming to us. Just because someone falls out of love is not a good enough reason to set aside what God has done. In fact, even with the piece of paper, the truth of marriage, what God has done, is not diminished. The standard is so strong that if a divorced woman, according to a piece of paper and not according to God, remarries, then both the woman and the new husband have committed adultery. And these people were not the initiators. They were not the ones who committed the fault for the divorce. How many of us 
in this room are affected by this reality. How many of us have been entangled in some way in the affairs of a divorce, in the sins of divorce, in the evil of divorce? How many people in this room have had a divorce for reasons other than sexual immorality? How many of us then are born simply because in our past a parent or a grandparent sinned in this manner? God doesn't just hate the sin, but he also despises the fruit of sin. What are we to do as a people about this? How can we make it right? Everything has changed. Nothing is the same, and we can't go back and fix the problem that we created. The course of life has gone in another direction. And because of this divorce, the penalty is death. The penalty is destruction and hell. Since there's nothing that we can do to fix it, then there's nothing that we can do. Nothing that we can do to avert our ultimate destination. And then here again, Jesus gives no comfort. He gives no release. He simply puts the screws down a little bit more and he continues with the law. He leaves the issue of divorce and goes to the topic of your word. Jesus said that we should take no oaths. To put our hand in a Bible and say, I will tell the truth. That is not good enough in God's way. We must, what we say must actually be true. Every word that comes from our mouth must be true. There must be no lie that comes out of our mouth. To swear it's by God is to suggest that what you are saying is as good as God. That it is perfect and without any kind of confusion. Can you say that? Is it possible for you to speak something that is without blemish whatsoever? And even more, is it possible for you to do this every time you speak in any occasion? To realize that any untruth that comes out of your mouth, even if it is a mistake, is sinful according to God's way. And we have a limited perspective. Maybe we see something in life. Maybe we see someone do something and, and we start talking behind their back. The reality is we haven't seen the whole thing. Because we haven't seen the whole thing, we miss something and now it's coming out of our mouth. It's false. Our yes is not yes. And our no is not no. And the penalty, the penalty for our sin is eternal condemnation. That's the text. If you read the text in your bulletin from beginning to end, that's it. But I would be derelict if I stopped there and not proclaim to you the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel which was already given in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 17, where Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. But I have come to fulfill them. If what Jesus says about the law is true, we have no strength to save ourselves. But Jesus does. Jesus fulfilled the law by following it entirely, by paying the price for your sins and mine in its entirety. This is our only comfort. Our only comfort is that Jesus comes to us from outside of us and saves us from our sin, saves us from ourselves. As a believer, your sins are forgiven. You are free from all of your sins. You do not need to fear the terror of the night or the judgment that is to come. As a believer in Jesus, your sins are covered completely. And now you are free. You are free to pursue life in the way that God has given you are free, free to work on your relationships with your brothers and sisters so that there is forgiveness and reconciliation. You are free to daily set aside your sin and pursue an upright and moral life. You are free to work on your marriage, and you are free to speak the truth in love for people. As God's children redeemed by the blood of Jesus, we can pray. And ask God to give us His Spirit to lead us in His way at every turn. 
daily confessing our sins, leaning on Jesus, the one who saves us, and doing the good that God lays before us every day of our lives. Let us honor the name of Jesus, which is given to us <coughs> in baptism, and let us remember always our sins, your sins, are forgiven you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Peace.